Welcome everyone to part one of the 2018 FBR Performance Series. Today's webinar is Shifting Mindsets, the Role of Culture in Aligning Teams for Success. A few moments ago, we did a quick audience poll on how closely aligned your operations and development teams are. So let's take a quick look at the results. And as you can see, uh, a majority of, of folks on this webinar um, have some alignment in their systems. Uh, Definitely some room to, to improve, though. Um, a few of you are very aligned, which is great to hear, and hopefully we can still provide some, some further um, advice and feedback for you today. And it's nice to see that nobody here thinks that they're not at all aligned in their two teams. So um, we're all off to a good start here and, and looking to make some additional impact today. So um, let's meet our panel today. Uh, we're excited to introduce our franchisors that we have with us, uh, Dr. Tina bacon DeFries, President of Big Frog Custom T-Shirts, Debbie Fiorino, Senior Vice President of Dream Vacations, and Steve Mills, President of the Franchise Division of EmployBridge and Remedy Intelligence Staffing. You'll meet each of them in just a moment, but first I'd like to introduce FBR's President and COO, Michelle Rowan, as the moderator for today's panel discussion. Thank you, Mike, and thank you everybody that's joined, and most um, importantly, thank you to the panelists for, for sharing their experience. What I love is that we have uh, a home-based business on today. We have a very large company. We have uh, a retail base, so I think we're going to get a lot of experience here. When we popped up that first poll, it was interesting because I wondered how the 18% where they're totally executing together, how big those systems are. So it would be interesting to next time kind of cross-reference it because I think as you grow, it gets harder when you're managing these operations and development teams and goals to really um, keep them uh, involved in the day-to-day -day with each other and what, what's going on. So um, thank you for everyone that responded. And to echo Mike's statement, please put in any questions. We want you to get the most of it and, and have some good takeaways. So uh, if you've participated in our series before, we usually share some data from our, uh, our research to start, and we have that again for today. Um, so I don't know if I can, Mike, are you sliding the slides or? Yep, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So it, this shows, uh, in the red, we're seeing the top quartile or the top 200 award winners from our franchisee satisfaction data. And we asked the question of franchisees, uh, do, does senior management promote a clear vision for the company? So here we're seeing 83% either agree or strongly agree from the top 200, where only 59% from the others, uh, other franchise systems are saying that. Um, so even th this is this I wanted to point out is even in the top brands, almost 20% of your franchisees don't believe that you have a strong vision for your company. The next uh, data point is when we asked about senior management encouraging a strong team culture, and so here we can see 83% uh, of the top either strongly agree or agree, where it's 58% of the uh, other franchise systems that are in our research. So the top brands are definitely encouraging a team culture. The franchisees are seeing that. There's a big discrepancy between those two groups. And the third data point show, asked uh, if senior management is effective in driving the company forward. And here we're seeing 80% agree or strongly agree for the top 200 versus 51% of the rest of the franchise brands that we polled. So the good news is that uh, in all three of these, the majority of franchisees are rating it, rating these, these uh, statements high, but there's still a group of franchisees that there's definitely a disconnect even in those top 200 brands. So this is an important topic to understand how it really impacts and drives your brand forward by getting everyone on the same page. Um, so we, we obviously know our panelists believe that there's uh, importance in aligning the operations and development teams. We're gonna throw up a quick poll for uh, the audience as we start our conversation. And what I really wanted to start with, I'm, I'm gonna start with you, Tina, but I wanna talk about how how is alignment integrated into the culture of your organization? So at the corporate level, how how are you really starting to have that conversation or show that alignment between the two sides of the house? Um, well, one thing we insisted on doing right out of the bat was have everyone under the same roof. Um, in the beginning, we had development people that were off-site, and we found that they just didn't, they missed the whole culture. Uh, the founders still run the company, so it's really important to us 
uh, to show that we're here, we're on the on the ground floor with with our people. Um, so having everyone in house was our first step, and the second step was to make sure everyone attends all of our meetings, our national convention, the Frogathon, um, and we really try to take it from top down. So we're here to have fun. We're here to put the franchisees first. Everyone knows that that is the first thing that happens during the day. We answer the emails. It's always about our customer, the franchisees. And that goes for everyone in development, um, as well as even just the front uh, office administration. That's who comes first, and that's what we do it, who we do it for. Um, but our other goal is to have fun while we're doing it. And that's easy to do with the people we have in our culture here. Great. And so, um, Tina, can you, uh, you're with Big Frog, can you tell us how many people are on your corporate staff? Uh, and, and when you say that they're in-house, you, you mean everyone's physically working out of the same corporate location? Correct. So we're very small. We have uh, 17 employees right now uh, with a majority in operations. We have two people on our development staff. Uh, so we're very small and um, it is definitely everyone's here. We have not even started using remote field support or business consultants because we just feel that it's so imperative that they get who we are at a fundamental level. We know we have to go that way someday. We just haven't we just feel it's so important that they get who we are. Great. Thank you. So, Steve, let's go to you. And before you answer the question, if you want to just tell us, you are part of a very large organization, uh, and then you have a franchise division. So in the franchise division, how many employees are on your corporate team? And then starting to talk about how, how do you show that alignment of the operations and development side in, in the culture of your organization? Uh, uh, let me let me pick those off one by one, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so parent company EmployBridge is the largest industrial staffing company in North America. Uh, as a as a mark of what we did, we issued almost half a million W2s to temporary associates in 2017. Uh, the franchise division, Remedy Intelligence Staffing, makes up about 15% of that. So we are a, I would suggest, a test case in a matrix organization. So we have 23 individuals under my direct control and management providing support exclusively to franchise owners, but we then also draw on many of the same services from our corporate operation uh, that our company offices draw from. So not only do we need alignment between our franchise support team and franchisees, but also between franchise support and corporate colleagues and corporate colleagues and franchisees, and a, a major part of my role is being the, the, the ringmaster in that three ring circus and uh, herding the cats and trying to keep everybody moving and on the same page. Uh, in direct answer to your question about the link between operations and development, it, it's essential. Uh, if development is telling a different story to what happens in practice, that's a recipe for failure. Uh, we've ensured that our development is on the same page as the ops group because development is embedded in everything we do. So our franchise development director attends all my team meetings, is on the weekly team calls, uh, and really is firmly embedded in everything we do. Perfect. So, so you're not only struggling with trying to, to wrangle the franchisee staff, the franchisees, that hard to uh, wrap around any contact with their employees for the franchisees, but you also have uh, a corporate entity to, to deal with. So that's a lot of juggling. <laughs> and Michelle, I mean, you, Michelle, you said struggling. I didn't. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, and, you know, it's balanced, but it's, it's why it's the whole topic of goalless alignment is essential. Uh, that there is no one correct answer to any specific problem. And as we get on to talk about culture, it's why written plans, written visions, and also a, a clearly established set of rules that, that dictate how we work with each other and with others is a roadmap to a lot of success in our business. Perfect. So we have the, the poll results up. So obviously there's uh, um, people understand that we could kind of move our businesses forward if everyone is telling the same story and, and living up to the same expectations. So that's fantastic. So Debbie, I'm going to go to you and, and have you tell us a little bit more about Dream Vacations. You, you're a larger system. So uh, tell us about your brands, but also then the, the, the number and the staff that support those uh, franchisees. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon or good morning for those of you in another coast or um, wherever you
whatever you might be. Um, Dream Vacations is um, a part of World Travel Holdings, so similar to um, <clears throat> what Steve said, we have to balance the needs of a, a corporation and the needs of a franchise organization. We have about 1,200 home-based franchisees um, all across the United States. We've been in existence over 25 years, um, and we have a staff of over 100, um, probably now about 115, um, mostly located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but some virtual um, that support um, the entire franchise network. And then, as um, Steve said, we have some people in our corporate level that we actually can leverage and pull on those resources as well, which is definitely a positive thing, but also, as he said, can be challenging. But I think we've done a great job getting them to understand by inviting them to conferences and other things to see the network and understand what it means to support um, a franchise network. Awesome. And, and for you guys, you have a general manager that oversees both your operations and engagement side and your development team, correct? Everyone reports up to the same leader. Yeah. So what we did about um, back in November, um, Drew Daly, our general manager of network engagement and performance, um, reported up through me and we had a separate vice president of recruitment or development reporting up through me. When we had a change, we decided to put recruitment underneath Drew so that we could fully align as everyone has already said, how important it is to make sure that development is telling the story of actually who we are and making sure that we're really looking at getting the right people into the network um, that match our culture, match, and match our needs so that we can help them be successful. Perfect. Great. So, um, so let's talk about, and Steve, I'll go to you and mix this up a little bit. So let's talk about some ways that um, the alignment is integrated into the culture of your organization. So what kind of um, meetings or checks and balances, what kind of reporting or common goals do you have between the two groups to make sure that they're aligned? What's the frequency of the, the time that they're together? I think, let me start with, because Michelle, you've, you've seen and witnessed this firsthand at our conference last year. Uh, we run an annual franchise conference, as I'm sure every other franchisor does. Uh, but at that meeting, we not only have franchise owners, we have many of their senior staff, their salespeople, their recruiters, and it's also widely attended by not just the franchise support team, but by corporate colleagues. So we've just come off the back of a highly successful uh, three and a half day event in Clearwater, Florida in April, where the first morning was dedicated entirely to what I would call corporate work. So a, a State of the Union address from our CEO telling the company-wide story, what, where the parents heading, uh, a CFO report, so complete transparency on all the numbers, uh, the good numbers, that where the numbers are less good, what we're doing about it and how it affects franchisees. It's really important that when we are talking about corporate-wide issues, we're bringing it back to what does it mean for the individual franchisee. But then from a, a standpoint of accountability, delivering our plan that we've agreed with our Franchise Advisory Council for the year, the key points along that plan. And finally, I think that the best example of alignment and transparency is having the four key executives in the company and myself stood on stage doing an open town hall for as long as it takes. Uh, we also this year added for the first time a, a trade show to our event. It was a trade show that had some external vendors but I think uh, it was an interesting development. We also brought in representatives of every one of the internal corporate departments that works with a franchisee. So we ended up with 30 plus booths at this fair, and it was a wonderful opportunity for franchise owners and their staff to meet with all the various departments. You know, be it, for example, we are big enough that we have a, an IT security department. They could meet with a couple of the key individuals from that department and talk about password protections and firewalls and all those good things. So it, there's no substitute when it comes to goal alignment, to, in my opinion, face-to-face -face conversation and coming back to the ultimate roadmap. So that, that annual conference uh, is essential for us. And really that, the, the agenda for that conference is driven from our Franchise Advisory Council, which is driven from feedback from their individual constituents. So I, I think a, a good summary way to look at this is let's start at the lowest common denominator. Let's take opinion at the local level. Let's keep cascading it through the various mechanisms and, and groups to make sure that it's being fully represented, fully represented in, the, in the end event. Uh, long answer to a short question, but that meeting really does 
form the, the, the fundamental approach for our year to ensure we're all on the same page. And then on a monthly and weekly basis through our various committees, we're checking in and adjusting the roadmap depending on what's happened in day-to-day -day business. Perfect. So, it, and you're visually putting your team together on the stage and answering questions or fielding those questions together, which is great. Um, and you also talked about that transparency, just giving them access to the vendors and, and the questions that they have. So I think those are both great. Debbie, you had mentioned, and something that comes up when we read franchisee comments, uh, if, if there's a, a feeling of not being supported, it's usually the customer service person that they're calling and working with directly in the corporate staff. They don't feel like the, that, they, that they believe that they're serving the franchisee as a customer, and, and that will come up frequently. And you made a comment that your real, the corporate team really believes that the franchisee is your customer and that you have the corporate staff bought into that. So how about some ways that, that you've really done that and, or, or even other ways too that you're really uh, integrating that alignment into the culture and that the franchisees see that? Yeah, that's great. I mean, so I've been with the division for about four years and that is one of the first things that we did is really understand who the customer is um, and put the focus on the customer and that that goes from development operations, customer support. You, you don't just need to be in customer support to understand that you are serving a customer. And these are, some, you know, the home-based business and the low-cost franchise, the small business owners just trying to make it work, trying to, you know, make the dream happen for them. And so understanding that and really putting yourselves in that position to understand who they are. Um, our mission for World Travel Holdings is to deliver a remarkable experience. And so that's what we live and breathe by. It's on our walls. But everyone, there's not one person in over a thousand employees that we have in World Travel Holdings that you would ask that, that does not know exactly what our mission is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but it's it's not our goal to be the largest franchise travel agency. It's our goal to be the most have the most successful franchise owners. Um, and so we continually reinvest in them to show them that's how that's that's how we care about them. And so. If we don't treat them as a customer, then we can't make them successful. The employees are, um, you know, on all of my direct reports, they, on their focal review, the Franchise Satisfaction Survey through FBR is part of how they are rewarded. Um, and the performance has been going up every single year. So we tie it back to pieces of compensation, bonus plans, um, making sure that they recognize that that is as important as sales. However, I have seen a direct correlation between the franchise business review survey and the increased scores have a direct correlation between uh, sales numbers, which have been increasing every year as well. Perfect. And I think that's becoming more common when I talk to clients is that there, there's a portion of their review or their conversation that is tied to the way that the franchisees are rating their their responsiveness or their 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 willingness to help in the business. Um, and then, um, Tina, I want to go to you as well uh, about – you had talked about the how the the goals are really visible and how what are the ways that you're communicating those goals out and how are you sharing that and connecting the team so that everybody's seeing those? Well, we have um, internally we have monthly meetings uh, as well as we use um, things like Slack and different methods just to communicate very quickly amongst each other. I know we're small, but still we can be very segregated if we're not careful. Uh, to the franchisees, we have quarterly uh, State of the Frog meetings, and those are not in person. Those are online. Uh, so that's one thing we're doing uh, to make sure they're aware of, of our goals and current projects. And then we're also actually implementing this month a monthly call with the founders that will be very specific to different topics where they can ask questions and kind of uh, uh, just get in touch with us on that level. We also utilize a private Facebook page where the employees here can communicate with the franchisees and their employees to quickly disseminate information on projects, uh, strategic partner updates, um, pricing updates, anything like that. So uh, we try to be very quick with all of our communications. I think we could do a better job um, on overall long-term goals. A lot of our goals that we talk about are very uh, short-term, maybe in 2018 goals, 2019 goals. Uh, so that's something we're working on this year as well. But uh, they all know every meeting we have starts with our mission statement and our common core goals and uh, values. 
So I think franchisees bought a big frog to be part of our group and be part of the founders because we're transparent, honest, and have integrity. And we just always want to keep reinforcing that uh, through the employees and then to the franchisees. Uh, so we take every opportunity we can get to actually communicate with them. That's great. And and one thing you said, so I think that I had mentioned it, franchisors tend to struggle that there's not a lot of accessibility to their franchisees' employees, some by choice because of the concerns about overreaching. So you had mentioned a private Facebook group, and the employees of each location can opt in to one group, so they're all connected and they're connected with corporate. Is that the way it's set up? It's allow, It's up to the owner if they want to allow their employees on it. They just have Let's Got it. it. On it. That's Some great. That's a good one. Not want their um, Steve, on I have a question for you that came in from from the audience. With your uh, annual conference, when you have the corporate staff tables, do they have a pitch or a, a list of topics that they're talking about, or are they? Is it just open, free for all? Franchisees can bring up anything that they want. Uh, we've done both. Um, so we, when we do the town hall. Uh, we're happy to take questions, even anonymously, ahead of time. But no, absolutely, the microphone goes around the room, and uh, every question's on the table. And remember, we, this is a room with a, a wide diversity of role in there, from franchise owner. We actually we added a rookie sales class as part of this year's conference. It made sense to do it. It, it was great to be able to communicate openly and directly about both short-term issues and long-term vision. So I, I think if, if as the leaders of the organization, you're not prepared to do that, it's going to be very hard to build alignment. Awesome. So you all, I, the next question is, do you have a written set of core values for your organization? You've all already alluded to that. Uh, so I would love if you're willing to share that. Uh, I did hear a little bit from Tina on every meeting starts with reciting that, which is fantastic. Um, so if you, I don't know if you're willing to share your core values with the group just so they can hear what you guys are, are putting into those. Um, sure, this is Tina. I can, uh, we essentially we have a mission statement which uh, where we start with our why, which is that we're dedicated to an exceptional franchisee experience uh, delivered with concern for the individual franchise owner and their employees. Uh, and we're just committed to constantly improving our operations and the business model to better their uh, equity in their business. Uh, and we just go on to say uh, that we take pride in having a friendly, gracious attitude, a giving spirit, and we're devoted to them and making them leaders in the garment decorating industry for their store. That's great. And, and so those are also shared with the meetings with your employees as well, not just with the franchisees and that. Uh, onboarding them kind right. of way. Every single awesome. meeting has it, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. So, Debbie, um, if you want to share, I know you have a core values, mission, and a vision. If you want to share those and then talk about the way that you kind of instill those. Sure. Um, our core values are to demonstrate pride, embody teamwork, work with passion, and perform with velocity. Um, again, as a as a franchisor with a home based um, low investment business, um, it's important that we work quickly and get you know get to the to the franchise owner. So that's why velocity and then pride, passion, and teamwork are just a core to who we are and who we bring in both as employees and as franchisees. Our mission, as I mentioned earlier, um, is to deliver a remarkable experience, and our vision is to broaden horizons. We um, it formed all the core values in our mission, especially form the, the basis for every company communication, every incentive plan, a recognition program, which we have automated so that we can recognize our employees um, corporate wide um, in a very uh, you know, a way that everyone can see that. Um, and um, the other thing that we recently added uh, into our language, which I don't know, we don't really have a name for it yet, but is just we care more about you. And whether that's our franchisees, our employees, our supplier partners, because as a distributor, we have a lot of suppliers. Um, and we really, a lot of times people ask me what makes a difference such as vacations, why is it a, a better place? And I really feel that it comes down to that we care more um, as a corporate staff, and that is really just you know, out there into the network, and they feel it. Um, and so that has become a very strong part of our language here at, at the headquarters for the franchise division. 
Awesome. Now, Steve, you gave us a slide, so I'm going to have the team put that up, and I'm going to let you speak to your values slide that you shared. Yeah, and we, these are employee bridge values, but they're also, they also guide the way we interact with each other, be that corporate colleague to colleague or colleague to franchisee. Uh, or even franchisee to end user client or end user associate. We have multiple relationships within our business, and we believe that these five values should govern and dictate all those relationships. So first and foremost on here, you'll see passion. We're, we're working with people on a daily basis. We talk about our overriding mission being to change lives one job at a time. We're very lucky. Well, we, are, we have the honor of providing employment to almost half a million people a year. And we take that honor very seriously, but we do it with passion, we do it with spirit, and also not with a little fun either. Um, we recognize that in those dealings, it is, it is expected uh, that we will act completely honestly, and we'll also act with integrity, and the, the two are different. Um, being honest is, is exactly as it says. It's, it's telling the truth at all times, being straightforward in our dealings. Acting with integrity is sometimes doing the right thing even when no one's looking. It's an old cliche, but it's very true. Uh, I think if we can maintain those two values in all our dealings with the people we work with, we'll be a better company as a result of it. Uh, that's, and with the multiple levels we work on, the matrix of our organization, sometimes we need to work with maturity. Uh, that does mean treating all our colleagues with courtesy, dignity, and respect, even when occasionally the answer is no. And while I would echo the sentiment of the other franchisors on this panel, that our, we do regard our franchisees as our clients, uh, they're also our partners. And sometimes we need to have an honest conversation with our partners that ends in the word no. And it's important that both, group, both sides of that discussion treat the other with maturity. And as a, as a side note to the conversation about help desk, I think it's also vitally important that those corporate colleagues on the end of the incoming call uh, know that if they're not treated with respect and maturity, uh, we will also stand up for them. And from time to time, I have called individual franchise owners out over the way they've interacted with a, you know, what they perceive to be a relatively junior member of the organization. You know, these values apply across the company, regardless of the title on your business card or the, or the size of the corner office. Uh, and then, then finally, families, family first matters. What does that mean? It means that there are school plays or sports days or things that we may want to pop out of the business for an hour to do. And we're not saying this means you can go home at three o'clock every day, but it means that we recognize that outside of your business life, you have another life, your family, and collectively as a team, we'll work to make sure we're putting our families first, but also our company family first. That doesn't just mean look after your home life. It means treat the team that you work with with the same respect as you treat your own family. Um, th these are really a roadmap that define our behavior, and it's something that I believe is fundamental to our success. I think that was great, and you brought up, uh, I have conversations with uh, my clients that will talk about, we need to teach uh, our team to say no more because everybody wants to, to make your franchisees happy, but it's not really about always saying yes, it's about coaching them in, in the kind way of saying no or explaining the why behind the decision or the no. And especially on the development side, I think that there's, there's a thought that your development people, they want to say yes, they want a deal to go through, and your ops people are going to be more of the hesitant of let's find every possible thing that could go wrong if this person comes on board. And so you have to find that balance between the two groups of being cautious and bringing in the right person for your culture, but um, also not just saying yes and, and bending over backwards to make it happen. So I think that was a good statement that goes both ways. If your franchisees are disrespectful, that conversation should be addressed and same with the corporate staff that you can say no, just make sure you're saying it kindly, I guess is the way to say it. I think, Michelle, there's also the long no and the short no. The long no is when you start a conversation, not actually knowing what the final answer is going to be and working for however long it takes with the individual to reach the right answer. And if the answer at the end of that is no, and 99 times out of 100, they're going to respect the answer because you've taken the time to truly understand the other side of the equation, to try and to find a way to yes, but maybe not quite getting there. The, the short no is when something is just impossible, 
and you don't play games with them. You explain crisply and clearly why that's not possible. And I also believe that by doing it that way, by acting with maturity, you gain their respect at the end of it. But the worst yeah, answer great. to any question, the worst answer to any question is maybe. That that doesn't breed alignment. That just de that that breeds discontent, and it just uh, a maybe almost always means no anyway. That's what my daughter says. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so when I was at the IFA this past year, I actually led a, a session. Uh, it was an exercise that we did, and uh, it was based on Roger McCoy. He's of Direct Energy. He's on the operations side. Uh, he did a, a, a paper for his graduate work called Positive Culture and Franchising. Uh, and he really focused on uh, making sure that you involve your franchisees in creating the core values and the mission statements that you're putting out there, which I, I think – some of us have inherited these core values, these mission statements, these values, uh, and they might not be up for discussion, but we used this list of questions from his paper for the exercise, and the idea was there's people that are on this call that might be trying to establish what those core values and the mission and vision statements are, and there's some that are probably very mature systems and, and have these things in place, and the idea was to use this list to kind of go through and create it, or to go through and check what you have currently in place to understand that you have the right core values. And it was great because we actually had um, Wild Birds Unlimited was on the panel and took this to their uh, annual retreat and actually reworked their mission and vision value statements based on it. So it was a great piece. And I just wanted to share some of the um, the the Evan Hackle from Engage Consulting shared a couple of slides with us there to try and help people understand how these are all evolving and, and how you really get people to, to understand them and live them. So this is uh, one of his clients, Mainstream Boutique, and they started with this what this was what they were giving to people and, and kind of just reciting and pushing out. And they ended up through reworking their the way that they wanted to present this and understand it. If you go to the next slide, they went through and created this journey and they shared this at their conference and it became a, a way for them to kind of understand the story behind this. It's the same things that they were saying that they, why they do what they do, who they are and how they get there. They just presented it in a, a story format to help people really ingra ingrain it. So this is from Carpet One. I'm sorry, this is not from Mainstream Boutique. So the difference in how you present them, the idea is that you just want people to really understand them, not just recite it because it's on the wall, but really live them. So uh, what Roger talks about uh, is making sure that all your shareholders have something in the creation of these and, and that they're involved in who, who are you and who do they think you are. Uh, and then is there visibility to your employees, the franchisees, the franchisees employees to the importance of this culture and making sure that your franchisees are creating cultures in their own businesses that are aligned with what you guys are doing in the corporate office. Um, so that they kind of connect the dots between the success of your brand and the growth of your business to those. So um, I just wanted to share that. And I, you guys have all been really great about talking about transparency and, and visibility to your to your leaders, which I think really helps do this. But are there other ways that you guys are communicating the overall culture to the to the franchisee level. So how are you checking what they're doing in their business or how are you checking how they are uh, running their employees and their business? And are there any tips that you guys have to help understand that things are going well all the way down to the to the customer facing employee as well? So Debbie, if you want to start with that, if you have anything that you're doing to, to kind of help with that. Yeah, so, um, you know, with Dream Vacations, it is a the it is a home-based division, uh, home-based franchise, and so there's not a lot of employees of the franchisees. They do have associates or other independent contractors. Some of them, some of them, but the, the you know the majority of them are single unit owners, um, and they're running this business on their own with a spouse or another family member or a partner. Um, so it's not your traditional setup, but um, we do have a Facebook page as well that we share and in, 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 um, the, the members of so that we can communicate and, and see how they're speaking to each other. I forget who said it earlier, but it is important that they're also treating each other with respect. Um, and you can see that at our conferences, at our regional meetings, uh, trainings, <clears throat> anytime we're in person. Uh, our CTO uh, from a corporate from World Travel Holdings went to one of our first 
his press conferences, and he said the one thing he took away um, from that was that how they weren't competitors of each other. They were there to help each other. And so we can see it in the culture that they're there. We're helping them and they're there to help each other. And that's obviously them helping their customers as well. Um, and we do obviously have, you know, ways to see how um, the customer is being treated through Facebook posts, through surveys, customer surveys, um, and making sure that um, our franchisees are doing that with their customers as well. And as Steve said, we don't shy away from having tough conversations if we need to. Um, it isn't always about just appeasing your customer. It is about being open and honest with them um, and making sure that, um, you know, they're holding up their end of the bargaining as well because it, it is a partnership. Right. And so you had, you were talking about your your franchisees are home based. So I was talking also, too, about the way you have so much that you do to make sure that they feel connected. and. I, you're in the travel industry, so you can talk about the ways that you get them in person, but also too, the, I want you to, to talk about your rewards and recognition programs that you do as well. So that there's visibility to each other and what's happening with those franchisees as well. Sure. Um, our employees at all levels use our, our reward and recognition program, our overboard awards to recognize each other. The franchisees know they can um, let us know so that we can recognize employees as well. We recognize our franchise owners virtually and in person at our uh, virtual um, town halls, at our, at our live uh, national conference. We send out monthly sales achievement reports. We offer a bonus commission plan. We host a reward trip every year. We just got off the Crystal uh, River Cruise um, with our top 20-some-odd uh, performing agents um, and spent a week just getting to know each other better. No conferences, no meetings, just doing um, – just sightseeing together and doing excursions together. Um, we have a company goals page on our internet that we update monthly. We do a CFO quarterly podcast um, and, um, and on and on. So it's, it's very open um, and, and we, we believe heavily in recognition. My background is in human resources. That's where I came from. So there's a direct link, um, I think, between how you run a culture of just an organization from a human resources perspective and how you run a franchise network perspective because it's the same needs. We're all human. We all, we all want to be rewarded and recognized. Um, and so we, we take great care in making sure that we do that. Awesome. And um, we have this uh, infographic that's up that talks about there is – uh, there is a correlation between people being happy in what they're doing and being more productive in your business, which will help you grow your business. But um, Debbie, you had also mentioned that you actually see a correlation between franchisee satisfaction and the growth of your brand. Um, so I think that that's yes. amazing that their satisfaction is actually impacting their sales numbers. That's crazy. Yeah. my our C, We have co-CEOs, but the CEO that runs this division, um, you know, we'll go to conference every year and spend the seven nights. We have a, um, a conference at sea, which is also a great perk of being in the travel business. So we spend a week on a ship um, with over a thousand people um, that are there to obviously, you know, intensive learning opportunities, but a lot of networking opportunities. And he said last year he walked around the ship and he puts himself way out there. So it's not like he's in his, you know, uh, corner office. He's out there talking to people saying, I'm Brad Tolkien. Let me know if you have anything to discuss with me. And last year he said he got one complaint for the entire week. And that, to me, is the difference, and in, in that has to, there's a direct correlation in the sales of this division that have been growing every year. It's the fastest growing division of World Travel Holdings, so there's definitely a direct link between the satisfaction and the sales. I love it. I love it. And that there's lots of studies on the employee side of that as well. So people that are happy will want to do more for you um, without being Absolutely. asked, so that's great. So, Steve, we have your slide, if you're willing to share that, too, about your alignment between your franchisees and franchisors, and if you want to just walk through that as well. Let me just pick up on a couple of those other points, um, because we are great believers in surveys. So, Michelle, uh, I'll avoid the commercial, but we've worked with your firm for three years. Uh, we've seen growth each year in, in our survey scores, uh, culminating this year with 91% of our franchisees said they would do it again if the opportunity arose. That was a long way up from where we were three years ago. And I think the way we've worked with the data from those surveys, presenting them openly and honestly has been a really important part of what we've done. Uh, we also work with um, an industry trade association, an industry body called Innovero, where we survey all clients, all end user clients twice a year, and all associates that work for us twice a year. 
you know, uh, getting a, an NPS score. And uh, for both our franchise brands this year, uh, they made the best of staffing, which is the top 3% in the industry from the talent. And one of our two brands made the top three for clients. So using that data, getting honest, regular feedback is a critical part of, of auditing. I think mean, what's the cliche, inspect to what you expect. Uh, I think we do that and we do that very well. Uh, we also adopt rewards and recognition. And so often awards are, are just for salespeople. But we have many other awards as part of our program where we do recognize people behind the scenes, people who aren't immediately obvious from sales numbers, but are an essential piece of our business. So you know, reward the behaviors you want to drive. We do that and we think it plays very well. So if you, if you want to hit that next slide, I'll just walk you through how we look at uh, communication and alignment with our franchisees. Are you talking about the slide that's up? We didn't put all of your slides in this. We, we do have them available. They'll be in oh, the I'm handouts sorry. that I'm go out up. to everybody. I'm looking at the wrong page. So uh, okay. first and foremost, consult widely and honestly. What does that mean? It means don't go to their office, sit with them, and try and sell them on something you've already decided. So we will lay out here's what we think or here's what the end goal is. Now let's talk openly and honestly about how we get there and potential roadblocks along the way. Once you've done that, then don't just go to the you know, four or five largest or the advisory council. Go deep into the organization. Go and talk to that mid-ranking franchisee that never calls you because they want something, never causes a problem, but they're the bedrock of most systems, the middle of the bell curve. Then once you've got that information, then put all that together in a plan for review. Uh, if you present that plan back and show that you've genuinely listened and adopted some of those ideas, suddenly it becomes we rather than us and them. Uh, once that plan's been presented for review, finalize it and promote it. You know, tell people exactly what's going to happen. Lay out a plan, a clear roadmap that shows when it's going to happen and how you're going to measure it. And I think one of the, one of the definite tips in successful rollout is if, some, if you know ahead of time something's not going to happen, at the date it was planned, make sure you're telling people in advance. The time to say the date's changed is not a week after you've missed it, it's two weeks before you've got there. And people will respect you for that. Not every plan is perfect. Uh, if you keep people posted on changes and amendments along the way, you've got a good chance of them coming with you. So when we talk about it, execute and amend openly, we will talk about our mistakes. We're not perfect. Um, I, would, I would argue there's never a plan rolled out that's perfect. But I think if you're open and honest with your constituents about what needs to change, often what you've learned as uh, the plan first gets implemented, uh, many plans are changed on the fly. Communicate clearly and openly why you're doing it, and you'll have respect. Uh, and finally, uh, a report back, and making sure that we've, we, we present what we've learned from projects and how we can improve going forward. Now, there, there are five simple boxes, but we've adopted this approach with pretty much everything we roll out. Uh, and I think we've a good track record of execution. In fact, within our corporate group, to say we're about 15% of the company. Um, I am slightly biased, so bear with me. Uh, you can't see I'm smiling over the phone while I say it, but we, we, have an ex we, we have a reputation for execution. And if, you, if something needs to be done in the franchise division, it gets done because we follow this plan. Awesome. So we're going to throw up a poll, a poll question to make sure everyone's still with us and, and awake. But um, want to talk about a, a few months ago, we, d we did a poll of franchisors and asked about alignment in their companies. And what we did was we saw that people that were in a C-level position that were polled, 60% of them said that they think their operations and development teams are totally aligned. The people that... Uh, were not in a C-level position of those same brands, said 35% were totally aligned. And then uh, when we asked, so totally aligned was the top box answer they could give. The second response that they could answer was it was just right. And 70% of C-level respondents answered um, that it was just right versus 54% of the the other non C level people, so there's definitely a, a, a disconnect between what the C level people feel like their organization understands and lives and what's really happening. 
Um, I know that, Debbie, you have specific examples of ways that you can see your culture and your values are playing out with your employees and that they understand it. And I, I'm hoping that you would share some of those, um, the things that they're doing that, that show that they care about what you guys are doing and what your mission is. Hey, sorry about that. I was on mute uh, to talk. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I, and I don't, you know, I, I think I've heard it a couple of times and I actually wrote it down. We're not perfect. So I, you know, I am sure that if we did a survey as well, there's some disconnect between what we believe and what's happening, but it's a constant, you know, pushing to make sure that you're paying attention and, um, and making sure that you're reinforcing that. There's a quote that I actually um, share with my team um, that if you can get, all the people in the organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. It's from Patrick Lencioni. He's an author. I have a quote under it. This is easier said than done <laughs> because we're fooling <laughs> ourselves with who we think that, you know, that we, we're per we can perfectly do that. Um, so you do have to put programs in place and, and put things together <clears throat> to make sure because it is, a, it is a true quote. If everyone's going in the same direction, um, things can be really, really good. Um, so we um, um, we use we, we. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was the, what was your question? Because I just read the quote. Was it regarding well, our I wanted program? To, no, I wanted you to talk about the um, the the charity work that year you guys are doing and what your employees are doing um, with the emergency Got assistance it. program. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry. So we've created um, um, a program called the Employee Emergency Assistance Fund. It's a voluntary program funded 100% by employees that I brought here 15 years ago when I started with World Travel Holdings. Um, and they contribute out of their paychecks whatever amount they want, you know, a, a dollar to whatever amount they want. It just continues every single paycheck. And um, it helps colleagues, um, employees that are in dire financial need. In 2017, we raised $20,000, which included a $10,000 corporate donation match to help employees impacted by Hurricane Harvey and Irma, in addition to what we collect out of the paychecks. So if someone's house burns down, they don't have somewhere to live. Um, you know, we have thousand, uh, over 1,000 employees at World Travel Holdings, and it's just it's, it's just a, a program like no other um, where people are just helping each other. The other thing that we've done is um, we are um, supporting our signature charity, Make-A-Wish. Employees spend free time supporting organizations during a paid volunteer day as well. So whether it's towards Make-A-Wish or something else, they get one day off a year with all 1,000 employees where they can um, do something for charity. Um, we really encourage our franchise owners to get involved with Make-A-Wish um, by, by hosting fundraising activities. During national conference, which is typically in the fall of the year on a ship, uh, we typically raise over $100,000 over the course of the week just from the franchisees on board. It's amazing. I love it. And uh, I spoke at the leadership conference at the IFA this year and talked about how how charity impacts the bottom line for each of his franchisees. The franchisees that did more events that were more involved in community charities were making more money. So and there's a direct correlation to that. Um, Tina, I don't know if you have other examples of how you ways that you see that the culture is really ingrained in all of the people in your brand. Give ways to measure that or see it in playing out in real life. Um, we we also use um, net promoter scores. Uh, we our stores only have two to three employees, so it's very easy to see when the employee grasps the culture. We get a lot of feedback. We get forty to fifty percent feedback on net promoter scores, so that's really helpful. Um, Twenty eighteen has been our leadership year. So we're doing a lot of focusing on our business coaches, specifically with the owners, about building a solid team that's invested in their culture. All of our owners come up with their own mission statements for their stores with their core values, and those get posted in their stores and disseminated to the employees as well. So it's, it's a lot of the business coaches' responsibility to uh, get all of the team members on board with that. We find the NPS is a great way to really uh, dive into those numbers. And we also actually track employee turnover, and that's a big indicator of whether the owner is, is in a good position and you know, really uh, giving them the Big Frog experience or our culture. Excellent. 
Um, I know that, Steve, I think that I talked about this with you. There, the, It's similar to what Debbie was saying, where you can nominate employees for doing something. Uh, we had one client that was telling us that they have a prize wheel. And so when people get nominated, they pull somebody out and they get to spin this wheel. And uh, for corporate employees, it, it doesn't even have to be a lot. It's a lot about that recognition side. Uh, but when you see someone living the core values, you pop the example in and then you spin the wheel you get time off, you get a free lunch, you get uh, a gift card. So it's just little things, but they really like having that in. Um, and then I know Wild Birds has the joy jar and they just keep this jar with those types of examples and stories and they share them out. They read them at each meeting. And Steve, did you simple, have more to add? Yeah, as, as simple as a weekly recognition. So on a weekly communication, we have what we call our wow board where anybody in the organization can send in you know, a couple of lines about a colleague, something they've done, and every week we feature something. You know, it, it's a great way to call out individuals who've gov gone above and beyond, but it also highlights, in a lot of cases, best practices and good ideas to other, others, which helps permeate that culture, as, as well as sharing best practice. Awesome. Um, so, and if you guys in the audience have uh, additional thoughts on, on how you're recognizing it uh, or how you kind of measure it or recognize it, I think that you can type those in and we can share those out too if we haven't talked about it. Um, but how about, do you guys do anything for your development and operations teams as far, and you can say no because I don't think it's as common, but are there goals aligned? Are there, and by that I mean their compensation, is there anything tied to the way that you measure their performance that impacts or is impacted by the other group? And Tina, I'll start with you. Is there anything tied to the development people, the way that they're compensated that helps ensure that they're bringing the right franchisees on or uh, vice versa with your operations team, how they support the franchisees in, in growing their businesses or, or adding more stores? Uh, we do try to compensate the operations team in terms of uh, how quickly our stores grow um, once they've opened, but there really isn't anything that ties the groups together in terms of incentives. Uh, which is a great idea. Uh, we have heard we've heard other concepts do that, but we have nothing in place to do that. And I would love to do something like that. Awesome. And um, Debbie, how about for you guys? Is there anything that you have in place? Yeah. So uh, we have a couple of things. One is a 401k match is is based on the results of um, the division, um, based on the results of the company. So we have we have goals that we set out every single year. If those goals are achieved, um, then the company matches 100% of the 401k. Um, it's always matched 100% of the 401k based on on um, how we've done. We've, you know, even if we've missed those goals, but we've hit other goals, we've done it because it's aligning whatever the needs that goals sometimes change during the year. And so it's just aligning everyone together to make sure that um, you know we win together or we lose together. Um, also, like I said, in, in some of the you know, focal reviews, our annual review period, we make sure that we're <clears throat> looking at not just what's your responsibility, but what the company or the division is achieving. Um, and there's no conversation that I don't have with my direct reports, my T operations development, whatnot, that doesn't, it doesn't matter what department you're in, we have to hit our goals together. And um, it could be a sales goal, it could be a service goal. Everyone has to be um, accountable to it, otherwise it doesn't work because everyone can, in some way or fashion, come back down and, and look at it and say, yes, I can see how I can help impact that. I love that. I'll say we struggle with that too, just having everybody understand that even though they're not directly responsible for a particular number, have them thinking about how they can impact it. So that's great. Um, Seba, how about you guys? Is there any alignment between your operations, the support, and the development side, either a measurement no, or a no? The development group's relatively new for us. We, we've kept the two separate. I, I do think as our development group matures, it will definitely come more in line with the rest of the group. But the, the, the franchise support group is uh, compensated based on EBITDA growth over prior year, uh, whereas the development group is compensated based on, on new openings. Perfect. So we have one uh, poll question for the audience, and I think, Steve, I've, I heard you say that you do surveys of the corporate staff, but we're going to ask the question of uh, the audience as far as if you're conducting surveys of the corporate staff to measure engagement. Um, 
Or, and so I'll ask you guys to just, Steve, I, I heard you say it, that you do it, but just reiterate, how else are you gathering feedback to ensure that your employees at the corporate level are engaged and that there's two-way two communication? So, Steve, if you want to um, touch well, on anything that you feel like you haven't brought up yet. Yeah, and actually, just by, by way of summary on that, we survey all constituent users. So we're surveying client companies twice a year. We're surveying associates twice a year. We're serving franchisees with the Franchise Business Review Survey annually, and we're surveying corporate colleagues annually. Uh, and those, the, in each case, we're not just getting the data, uh, we're taking the data, using it, and following up on it. Uh, and I think it's a very important part of our success. We, we measure how we're doing in all four of those key constituent areas. Awesome. And Debbie, I think you said that you do um, an annual engagement survey with the corporate team as well? Yes, on the corporate level, we do a annual survey. Um, as Steve said, we take the, the results of that um, and make sure that we're not just looking at, you know, obviously what we're doing well, um, but obviously where we can improve on. But even where we're doing well, you know, there's a saying to focus on your strengths and not your weaknesses. And so where can we, you know, how can we leverage, how can we do even better in the areas that we're already succeeding in? Um, and we also participate in external surveys, um, the local um, top workplaces survey, survey hosted by um, um, an employee engagement platform called Energage. Um, and we were recognized as a top workplace in South Florida for four years in a row now on that one. And we've been named to Achievers 50 Most Engaged Workplaces, which Achievers is, a, um, is the employee recognition software that we use um, to, to um, recognize our employees um, so that everyone can see it because we're, we're a pretty big virtual company. Well, and that's great, too, because as unemployment is very low and it's hard to find employees, having those types of awards or those that third-party validation that you have strong uh, employee engagement and satisfaction is a great way to get hires, too, or get your pick of the top hires. So um, another that's benefit true. of of sharing that information. That's good. We've heard, and we've Tina, I, heard I, feedback. I'm sorry. What was that? I was going to say, we've heard recent feedback from people saying that they – that they saw our awards and that's why they came to the company. So I think that's a good point to tell everyone that if you don't be afraid to say it, um, make sure that you're out there and you're advertising, telling them who you are, um, people are looking for it. And they also look for companies that are giving back to your point earlier. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Tina, you said you're a smaller office, so you're not, you haven't done any kind of formal surveying, I think you said with your corporate employees, but are there, is there anything else that you're doing to kind of measure that, that feedback and that satisfaction? And we do have the poll results up as well. So it looks like um, the majority of people are, are surveying with either third party or internal. It took me a second to add those up. Um, but Tina, other ways that you're measuring that? Uh, because we are small, we have a pretty good gauge. Um, on the company, but we do every year have an annual initiative drive. So we meet with every single employee, the founders, and they bring their initiatives to either create a stronger team culture. Um, so for instance, this year we had employee bring in, you know, we want to do charitable work. So we give them 40 hours a year off to go do uh, work, um, charitable work. And so we do have that kind of feedback to try and strengthen us internally. And we actually do let the franchisees know um, what we're doing with the, the, employees on those type of things. Um, so it's more just 17 people. You kind of know if someone's having a bad day. So it's a, it's, it's easier to gauge. Yes, absolutely. So I have uh, well, one more. Uh, Michelle, one more from me, oh. if I may. Yeah. I would just, and I, we all know this, but it's a good reminder. Uh, we're all being surveyed on a minute by minute basis on the internet. Um, on Yelp, on Google, wherever we, wherever there's an opportunity for our end user to comment on our services. And it's critical that as companies, we are responding to those uh, particularly negative comments as they pop up quickly and efficiently, you know, be that with a direct follow-up phone call or certainly some form of online recognition that acknowledges the problem and asks how they'd like it dealt with. Awesome. The, and so I'm going to ask you guys one more question. And, and so as I'm doing that, I, I want to just ask people that are participating and listening, if you have questions, we're going to open it up to Q&A when we're done. Um, what you have here is something, from, again, from Evan at Engage Consulting and Tortal Training. This is the only thing that they give the employees for their reviews that they're doing. And what they're doing is instead of um, just delivering feedback to the, to the employee about how they're doing, 
it's 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 for the employee to give feedback in and measure whether they understand what the company's vision is and their role in making it happen. So I think it's an interesting take to work into the way that you talk to people because it's we're always getting feedback from everyone, but this is really, are they helping you articulate your vision and move your brand forward? So something to just um, think about as well as you do that. So we're gonna end this question with really starting at the beginning because it's all about expectation setting. And so my question is, is is your culture or the alignment of your operations and development team the way that you support your franchisees is that discussed with candidates in your development process as something that sets you apart um so tina i'm going to start with you on that one uh absolutely part of our discovery day process is them touring the office meeting with our operations group at the same time um the operations group sits in on webinars that the development team gives. So it is something we try. The big thing about the, uh, our candidates is they have to understand we're a unified front to help support them and help them be successful. So it's definitely part of the key uh, message we're giving. Excellent. Um, because I think that if you have if you have them aligned and it's something you're doing right, it's not it's not how the majority of franchise systems are run. So if you can back it up, using that as a way to really differentiate how you support them. If your development team is involved with candidates once they become franchisees in any way, that's something that's very unique as well. Um, so Steve, I will go to you and, and ask, I know that you're just ramping up your your efforts and growth, but are you talking to candidates about the culture and the alignment of your operations, your support side with with the new franchisees that are coming on board? Oh, com completely. And by the time somebody has passed through our entire development process, they've had individual conversations either over the phone, through webinar, or direct in person with just about every department head or department member that's going to be interacting with them. You know, we, we, we've got a lot of corporate support departments that are at the mothership rather than part of the franchise team, and it's really important that the prospects understand that. We want them to truly understand what a life in the day is. And my counsel to both development and ops is the worst thing that could happen for a prospective franchisee that joins us is about a month in, I get a phone call saying, Steve, you didn't tell me about this, or I didn't realize I'd be doing this. Uh, that's how failures happen, and it's critical that up front people understand not just the basic blocking and tackling of the business, but the lens we view the world through. Awesome. And and Debbie, how about you guys? How are you talking about it with candidates? Um, yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, it's difficult because we, we, you know, I think we sell more franchises at being a low-cost franchise um, than probably the people on the phone. Um, so we have to get to people in mostly in a virtual way because um, we are bringing people in from everywhere and they're not necessarily here to do a discovery day. Um, so, but what we, what we tell them is that we don't sell franchises, we award them um, and that we want to make sure that they really understand who we are and that we understand who they are and that they can align with our culture and our mission. Um, they do come here for their, every month we have classes here and so there's a class here today actually and usually when I ask them, why they joined us, and the number one answer is the franchise development specialist. Um, they really got a good feeling for who they are um, in that relationship, and who they are is exactly who Dream Vacations is, because we make sure that we have people who really live up to our core values out there, the best people in the organization selling franchises, to make sure that they're demonstrating our core values and our mission, and if that gets through, and I, I think uh, Steve mentioned earlier, surveys out there, whether it's on Yelp or Google or on your Facebook pages, you know, the other thing they tell me is you don't see any bad surveys out there. And then I say, well, I'm glad I paid them off. But <laughs> um, but it's true. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone's some awesome gets said about you, but making sure you're addressing it. People like transparency again. They just, they, they want to make sure that um, you're, you're, a pers you're a company of values. Um, and so I think making sure that that's out there so they can really see who we are as well. Perfect. So I think we're going to end it there with what we have prepared conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Mike to wrap things up. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, great conversation so far. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience, and I, I would encourage anyone else to, who has questions to uh, continue sending them in. We have a few minutes, so um, we're able to get to a few questions if, if there are some. 
Um, I'm going to start by asking a question that came in earlier in the conversation. Um, and, and someone in the audience would like to know what each of you has in terms of a human resources department. Um, is it is it a group? Is it just a single person that's in a dedicated position, or or is it a piece of somebody else's job entirely? Um, and Debbie, let me start with you on that question. So um, I am the senior vice president of Dream Vacations and human resources for the entire company, um, and have a uh, team of 20 people underneath me in the human resources area. But I have a vice president of human resources who um, really runs it day to day, so that I can focus on 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 um, running the revenue division. Um, we are a larger company though, so um, again, World Travel Holdings, Human Resources supports all of the, all of the company, including training um, and, um, and recruitment and all of those functions. So, but it is, from one HR person's opinion, um, you should have a person who's responsible for the, for the internal culture um, and um, human resources functions that aligns with your leaders um, that are driving that 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 are uh, focused on the network um, to make sure, and that's I think where it really um, helps make the magic happen. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Tina, um, I know you, I know you guys have a, a smaller system. Is it kind of a, a similar situation where there's one person in charge, or um, how does it work in your brand? Um, there's really, we don't really have an HR person. Um, it's, uh, we kind of just played all by ear. So, which I know probably freaks Debbie out, but, um, no, we are, it's not as a small, I mean, I get it. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I'm actually HR slash president, um, just for now. So, but I have ADP and they do a lot of it for me. <laughs> That's it. Excellent. Well, it's good to have the the, the external resource as well. Um, and and Steve, how about how about in Flybridge? The, uh, yeah, we're, the HR? we're probably a we're probably a bad example because you know staffing is our business. So we have a very large HR department. I mean, a tip I mentioned earlier, we issued almost half a million W twos last year. A typical week, we are payrolling almost ninety thousand temporary associates. So you can imagine the size of the HR department we have dealing with just payroll. Um, then we have two and a half thousand direct corporate colleagues. So yeah, we have an extensive HR department. Um, as a as a business unit president, um, I have access to HR to assist with things like performance development, reviews, benefits. So yeah, we're very well resourced in that setup. Right, and that that would make sense that you would have kind of an extensive HR department with the nature of your business. Yeah, I started well, trying to count them and realized there are more people there than I know how many we've got. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, thank you. That's a, a good wide range of answers on that question. Um, one, one other question that we have is how often um, are each of you updating your or updating or reviewing your, your core values and your mission statement? Um, we talked kind of about what they were, but, you know, how often are you taking a look at them? Uh, Tina, can I start with you on that one? Um, I think we've done it three times now. We've been in business 10 years, so not very frequently, but we do try to do it again when we have a new, we have enough new employees that can maybe contribute to the new uh, core value statement. We like to get their feedback on that. Great, great. Um, and, and Debbie, how, how often are you updating or reviewing your values and mission statement? We you haven't know, updated our values, our mission statement in over 10 years, maybe longer. Um, we review them often and hold ourselves as a senior team for World Travel Holdings, the senior exec team, speak about it often. Uh, you know, when we're putting in new programs or doing something, we ask ourselves if it's delivering a remarkable experience, if we're working within our core values. Um, and sometimes we're not, and we have to readjust um, and recognize that, you know, that you have to focus on certain things and, and say no to other things. But, you know, hopefully your core values and your mission are core to who you are and they don't change frequently. Certainly as a startup, it might change more often, but once they are who you are, and obviously if the world evolves and that affects that, um, you should also take a look at it as well. Perfect, perfect. And Steve, same question for you. Uh, how often are you updating or reviewing? Similar answer. I mean, they are not operating um, methods or principles, their values, their who we are, 
they're ingrained in us. Um, we Remedy has been part of the EmployBridge uh, network for four years. They haven't been reviewed during that time, and I wouldn't expect them to be re reviewed anytime soon. I think they sum up who we are, and we hold ourselves accountable to those values. Excellent. All right. Um, so we actually have two more questions that came in. I'm going to I'm going to read one of them first and then I'm going to go to the other one. So you have some time to think about it. Um, this question that just came in is a great one. Can any of the panelists give an example of when they changed the opinion of a negative franchisee who might have been unhappy or, or not validating well through cultural alignment? Um, so might be a little bit to unpack there. So I'll give you some time to think about that. And in the meantime, uh, an easier question for you. Do you do any team building events for your ops and dev team together? And um, presumably some of that might take place at your annual conference, but um, anything that you have to add to that would be great. Steve, let me stay with you to start on that question. What, what activities are you doing together? Um, I hold a quarterly meeting of my direct reports and some of their key people, and we mix ops and development. I also bring in corporate colleagues with specific areas of expertise, so I treat the group really as one group. Uh, I think that ensures goal alignment. I hold a weekly direct report with other key members on that call, where for one hour each week, everybody literally has a few minutes by way of an update as to their key issues and road, roadblocks. Uh, I believe that the, the 12 most important people in my organization uh, have a good understanding of each other's jobs and their goals as a result of it. I think it helps promote understanding at all levels. Wonderful. Um, Debbie, how about you? What, what events um, are you doing for your ops and dev team together, if anything? So, uh, I mean, we, you, I think you mentioned the national conference, the, we're together, some of our regional events, we have people together, maybe not all of them together all at the same time, um, but when, it, when we're all together, we certainly do things as a team. Our business development team has um, quarterly meetings, they come together, they have the franchise development team come in to exchange, you know, to make sure they're being updated on, on things that each other's doing. Same thing, the franchise development team um, comes in and they, they have other teams come in. So trying to find ways to do that. And then, you know, because we're all across the United States and so are our franchise development specialists, we um, invite them to other events. So whether it's with our franch existing franchisees, our franchise development specialists um, know our existing network really well, um, even if it wasn't them who recruited them in. Um, so they see them as an extension of, corp of, of the support, not as just someone out there just trying to build our network. Great. That, that's that's great to have everybody working together like that. And um, Tina, what what about you? With with are there any events that you're doing for your ops and dev teams together? You know, again, we're so small as a team, as a whole group. We do a lot together. We have specific team building events just for everyone in the company. So, um, but operations and development spend a lot of time together, just by the nature of the fact that development has to understand what they're what they're selling. So, yeah, we do a lot of happy hours and, you know, charity work and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Sure. That's, that is great. Okay. So, um, I just want to come back to that one question from earlier. Uh, is Does anyone, and, I, and I'll just open the line for whoever might have something, who, who has an example of um, working with a, an unhappy franchisee to turn things around through kind of a cultural alignment um, process? You know, I, I, let me, if I may, I'll give you a big picture example. This isn't just one, this is a group. So we've been working with Franchise Business Review for three years, three surveys. In January 2016, around two thirds of our franchisees responded to the survey and approximately half when asked the question, would you buy the franchise again, said yes. Fast forward three years to 2018, uh, 93% of our franchisees responded to the survey and 91% said yes, they'd buy the franchise again. And that was done issue by issue, item by item, through taking negative feedback, agreeing, aligning goals on where we were heading, reporting in regularly uh, and transparently, and three years later, we have a different business. All right, that, that is awesome, thank you. Um, Tina or Debbie, do either of you have uh, examples to share? It's okay if you don't. This is Debbie. I was going to give a big picture example as well. Um, 
just because so recently we you know when you have to go out there and communicate something to the network that um has to do with fees or royalty fees or anything that's not going to obviously be um that could be construed as a as a negative because it could cost someone more money um we had to roll out something that um literally i got out of 1200 franchises two responses that were somewhat negative and not even completely and it quite honestly very shocking because they recognize that culturally who we are and how we are supporting them has changed over the years and nothing, the, you know, the structure had not changed and they could appreciate it and they could understand it and they might not be jumping up and down about it, but they, they respected it. Um, and so I think that's aligned with who we are as a culture. I actually, I was just on an inaugural. We have, when new ships come out, they, they have two days of travel agents experiencing the ships um, so they can sell the, you know, sell the cruises. And I was just sitting down with a franchise that is a married couple who've been with us for 23 years and has kind of lost, I think, the connection to us, hasn't been to a lot of events and has been somewhat unhappy. Um, and we left feeling really good about where we were going. And it, all it comes down to, and I think everyone's tried to express this, is being open and honest, we might agree to disagree on certain things, but they feel respected and they feel like you're hearing them. Um, and that you're making the best decision, even if that decision is not necessarily for that one franchise. Um, I, I can't think of all the examples, but again, we're not perfect. So I've had lots of those conversations where someone has not been happy um, and the conversation has turned to a place of mutual respect. That is, that is great. That's a wonderful story to hear. Um, Tina, did, was there anything that you wanted to add to, to the conversation about uh, turning mm -hmm. around a negative franchisee? So, uh, I mean, for we use FBR, of course, too, but uh, we actually uh, were more granular, I mean, because we are small. So if we do have a franchisee who's not happy, and usually it's in regards to performance, you know, revenue levels, we actually, the founders, uh, you know, my two partners, will put them in a special uh, coaching program just with us to make sure they understand they're the most important thing and work with them directly. And I know that's not feasible when you're talking about these huge systems maybe, but uh, it's a way that we've managed to recover failing stores or people that just felt neglected or not heard as part of a system. So it's definitely something we work on uh, as a on as a as needed type of basis. Uh, but we do because we still are the founders and are active, we, we want to be that um, contact for them to make sure they understand why we're here and we're here for them. So that's something we do. Fortunately, it doesn't come up very often, but when it does, we handle it. That's great. It's awesome to have that in place when you need it. Okay, I am going to send everyone home on a real easy question that just came in at the end there. Um, how many franchise development team members do each of our panelists have on your team? So if you're willing to share that, um, that would be great. And, and we're going to wrap it up right after that. Um, Tina, how, how many development members are on your team? We have two members. Great. And Debbie? We have eight plus um, uh, two resources, sales support uh, resources as well. Excellent. And Steve, how many are on your uh, team? Two and an external consulting firm on retainer. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. Um, really appreciate the great conversation. And thank you to the audience for some great questions and, and participating in our polls. Um, this has been a great part one of our series. And part two is coming up this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. A little preview on your screen right there. Um, so we look forward to seeing everyone again uh, in a couple of days. And until then, have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much.